Hi, I'm Ralph Preston and welcome to Stroke Buddies Stroke Survivor Support Group meeting. We have these meetings every Tuesday at 11 o'clock, although the next two weeks it's going to be at uh, on Monday in two weeks and next week at 11.30 instead of 11. We post these on uh, my YouTube channel so people who can't make it um, and uh, watch. We're trying to um, develop content um, that's meaningful, that might be able to help you in your recovery or help you understand more about your stroke and what you're dealing with. And um, today we're honored to have um, a friend of mine named John Loomis. Yeah, it's an honor, John. And um, John's a, um, I guess you're coming up on eight years. Yeah, seven and a half now. Eight, eight in December, if I remember right. Yes, correct. Okay. And um, John's one of those people that just wasn't going to lay there and take it. You know, there are a number of us here in this group, and that's part of the group, um, is to try and inspire people as to how those of us who have managed to get better, got better, and what it takes. And John's one of those, uh, well, I used to call them pay it forward people until yesterday in Michelle's group, suddenly out of my mouth came veterans, stroke veterans. <laughs> and uh, I think that one might stick. So. Those of John's a, a, a stroke veteran. Um, I first got uh, onto him. Well, he and Michelle have a group called um, Stroke Sweat Squad, and um, together. And I became aware of John through that group and through the his. He posted some videos and some comments, and I agreed with his comments, and I liked his videos, and I could see that he was somebody who. Um, was an adapter, somebody who figured out how to make it work one way or another for himself and then therefore and shared it with other people. So I invited him here today to tell a little bit about his story, but also for uh, us to talk a little bit about some of the things that were um, key in his story that uh, became key in his recovery and how you might go about having the attitude and setting up a program at home and uh, adapting exercises and all the things that you need to do in order to work on getting better outside of physical therapy because a lot of us here believe that physical therapy is not enough. So that's the world's longest introduction, John. And uh, why don't we just start with um, you telling us a little bit about your story, what happened to you, and how you dealt with it, and and uh, at least the beginnings of, of how you um, managed to come back. Sure. Well, I want to thank everybody for letting me get in this group for the day, for the discussion. Uh, again, my name is John Lummis. I had my stroke December 25th, 2013, and actually 26th, the day after Christmas. Um, I was sitting at my desk at work, and I, I thought more or less I was having a heart attack because my left arm was going numb or it was actually weighed extremely heavy. I couldn't move it. So I was thinking numbness. So I started concentrating on breathing to get as much oxygen in my lungs as possible. Then when my son called me on the phone about doing something to his truck over the weekend, he couldn't understand my speech. So I knew speech, I knew I was, it was, at that point I was, there was, it was a stroke. I was a volunteer firefighter slash EMT for the local town I'm in. So I knew some of the signs would come about. And so I typed on my computer screen stroke in case somebody walked in my office they knew what would happen to me in case i passed out because i had no idea what would come next so my wife was coming for lunch that day and she showed up about five minutes later and she said well get in the truck and i'll just run you to the hospital and i said i can't move i can't walk she says okay so she yelled and the office i worked in was just another guy and myself she yelled at him to call an ambulance because i had a stroke and she was actually talking to our my big boss up in fort wayne indiana and he acknowledged that he probably just had a stroke so he they called the ambulance. The ambulance came in. They wheeled in a cart and says, hey, we can't get the cart into your office. Can you get up and walk? I got up and walked and went sat in the ambulance. So the, the stroke was intermittent. Or the loss of my le uh, left side was intermittent. It was an ischemic stroke deep in next to my emotional center. So they were worried about me the entire time in rehab about my emotions. I'm going, I don't need to talk to the psychologist. I went on the floor of the physical therapist. So like, they wouldn't argue with me. They said, go, get out of here. 
So let us know. We have medication if you need it. Well, no, no, we're not playing medication games. So as I got evaluated there, I was in my rehab. I thought, you know, I thought all I ever know about people having stroke is they 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 whittle away sitting in a chair doing nothing. So I, I thought my life was over until I met the physical therapist that decided to drill my butt every day. And they said, you're not to be not to allow anyone to help you. You have to figure it out yourself. Well, that just started me on my journey right there. I wouldn't let anybody touch me, do anything I was supposed to do. I did it myself. Well, it was transfer from the wheelchair to the bed, back from the bed to the wheelchair, clothing myself every night. I mean, I laid my stuff out the night before, had the stuff ready to go in the morning. The nurse come in and flip the light on. I'd change clothes, go in the bathroom, get cleaned up, head down for breakfast. I mean, I was, I was supposed to be in there 24 days. They kicked me out after 18 days to go home. You've already completed completed everything here. You're doing everything you're supposed to do. And I started outpatient therapy for the next year uh, at, at RHI in Indianapolis, which was a wonderful facility, and at IU uh, Robotics, which was more or less working my arm and my shoulder as much as they could work with that one. So and the therapists are what gave me my life back. So th this then comes in the costumes. I was involved in a advanced therapy um, study at RHI where we did an hour every day for 30 days. It was 20 minutes treadmill, 20 minutes stairs, 20 minutes across ground. Uh, by day three, they had a 60 pound weight vest on me. I was walking stairs two at a time. Uh, if I put my hand on the rail, I was getting my hand smacked to keep take my hand over the rail. Uh, the treadmill, they were having me up to 10 kilometers an hour for 30 seconds at a time. I thought I was gonna die, but I was suspended, so I wasn't going to work. Uh, across the ground, which was be balance beam, walking the ladder. They actually roped me up to a powered wheelchair that had been powered down and had a therapist sit on it, have me pull it through the facility like I was a, a workhorse, just pulling this thing around the building. Um, so I learned those were three key things I had to keep working on was continue to walk, stairs are my friends, and to get outside my, my comfort zone, not just flat concrete, get on different types of surfaces to walk and learn how to keep my balance. Uh, most of my therapy at that point was sporadic. I'd have like a, uh, maybe a session a week because we spaced them out because insurance. And I asked the therapist, I said, well, do you want me to sit inside and do my, ther my therapy lessons or do you want me to go outside and work in the yard? He goes, go work in the yard. You do more on your own than we can do for you here. So go work in the yard. Go push mow your yard. Well, my neighbors all got ticked at me because it's 90 degrees out and I'm pushing mowing my yard. And they're all mad because they want to come over and cut my grass. So, no, you don't understand. My therapist wants me to cut the grass. Leave me alone. I'm fine. And they keep coming with their power mowers. I said, I got this. I'll just push from the yard. So I had to argue with neighbors. So again, it was up to me to figure out how to do this stuff, not for everybody else to do it for me. And that was just stuck in my head from day one. Um, I've been heavily involved with um, this group called CPRG, which I don't remember the name. It's, it's with the college here in Indianapolis called University of Indianapolis. It's with their therapy school. It uh, was developed by a doctor over 20 some years ago. We used to have um, actors come in and portray uh, having a stroke or a loss of something, use of something. And that's not the same as when a therapist is trying to work with you when you try to act like you had it versus feeling how you actually are because you do have it. So the doctor decided to see about patients coming, live patients coming in and working with the students. Well, as the students go through their two, two to four year college, they have over a thousand touches on patients in classroom with the professors, you know, they'll be like, most times I show up in a class, I'll get three students for 30 minutes. And I, they'll switch out class. So I'll get three more for 30 minutes and maybe another set for 30 minutes, sometimes as much as four students. But for them to be able to work with me and feel different things, my legs, my arms, and to actually work on vitals on me and how to take blood pressures on your, your on your down around your ankles. So I can't, it's, it's been very beneficial to me, even though they don't realize how much it is because they have not been taken into the, corporate world yet and worked with the hospitals and the insurance and so their minds are still pretty open at this point they're not closed down as much so they have a lot of good ideas that never get out of the classroom and it's been i mean i also work with uh iupui which is iu purdue down in indy uh, they do a they do a uh, wellness clinic in the spring it's four weeks long it's usually almost two hours every thursday we work with ot and pt at the same time and they have come up with some great ideas and some work with me most times i get a, a group of usually four to five students for the whole time. And they are graded on their, they're evaluated on what they have learned from me and what they've, uh, the interventions they've given me and what the, the end progress where the end of when work was. And so far every year for five years, these students have got an A in their class. 
the professor knows me well and she knows I will challenge them. I will not let them up, give up on anything. And that's the same with these uh, professors at, at University of Indianapolis. They know I will tell them things going on with me that they're not going to see. I mean, I may be standing there working on balance and my, my left toes are curled under, but they can't see that in my shoe. I will make them, I will tell them what's going on so they actually can feel down with you and see what's going on. That better help them become better therapists once they are out of school. Uh, the, the, I said professors down there, they, they ask me in different classes, they want me in different groups. They know I wear the superhero costumes. Um, sometimes they allow me to wear them in class just for the fun of it, just to break the ice with the students. I just got done with the class two weeks ago. It was a, had three sessions with uh, two students each and I had a, an intervention session in the afternoon with each of those sets of students. The gentleman that was taking his doctorate for physical therapy was one running the Zoom class. I was his first contact with the CPRG group, and I actually had my Deadpool outfit on that day because they were working on interviews, their interview skills. So I walk in this room to sit down, and I'm in total Deadpool. I'm in case. They don't know who I am. They have no okay. clue who I am. But he goes, it's funny. It's full circle. You're my first contact with CPRG, and you're my last contact with CPRG before I graduate. So it's just funny that kid remembered it three years ago. And a lot of students argue within their dorms that, the, that they have the superhero in their class or not. They're still, I'm, I'm sort of half known around the class and it's been sort of fun, but it's the beneficial part to me is to get out there in the community and work with the stuff and teach these other students to be better therapists. When they get out there, they can help somebody else. And some of the stuff I explain to them or sometimes they experience with me, they might remember that as they get into out in the field and work with somebody going, I remember some guy did this, but how do we get to that point? And they may make a, a link with that stuff and make them better students and better therapists. The biggest thing that one of the things that did turn my life around the most is I looked at different stroke groups when I come out. My sister kept telling me, you need to go to a support group. You need to go to a support group. I didn't feel like I needed to go to a support group because I thought most support groups are going to be all the poor me stuff. And I was when the, I looked online on Facebook and found a few, and that's who they were. They were all poor me, poor me. So I, I got away from all. And I was getting ready to leave any, looking on anything on Facebook, and all of a sudden somebody clicked this little invite to me. I'm going, okay, so I checked out this other little group over here. I'm like, hmm, this looks like the group is perfect for me. And that person's on the bottom of the screen right now named Michelle Jensen. <laughs> and she turned, she gave me a lot of focus on what I could work on and gave me a lot more that I could handle. And at the same time, I think we've inspired each other to the whole thing. But that group is what helped, has helped me for the biggest part, turn things around. Because I didn't know what this journey was going to be like. And when I was in, actually had my stroke, I, there was nobody in the stroke wing with me besides one other guy and he his stroke was to his um right left side of his brain so got his right side so our deficits were not the same and i had nobody in the facility to look up to to get answers to from so i try to take all this stuff i learned now and give it back to the people that go through stroke or anything else and give them somebody to talk to which that's why i needed time with somebody to talk to to show me i can do this stuff besides the therapist i wanted to know that i could do this stuff and the stroke squad the Michelle design has been perfect fit for me. Um, it's been wonderful. I can't, I can't say enough about Michelle and a few other people are in there that harass the crap out of me. That's okay. It's mutual. Uh, it's it's been a it's been a journey, and I had no idea this was going to be my journey. Um, I just want to get better for myself. And as I come through stuff that I learned in therapy, I come home and try to replicate the same stuff. Like everybody's familiar with using the sanding box, so like that. Well, I just use my air hockey table turn the air hockey off and just use my hand on the, the paddle and move it back and forth and start doing the same motions as they're doing there. Um, I know they have the, I think it was a box you put your hand in to get warm sand or something like that to get your hand to warm up. Well, I looked at one of those wax machines that I used for the hands to get their hands softer. And so I got, well, the wax was a little too warm for my hand, but I was just trying to think of ideas. What can I do at home instead of going through all the therapy stuff at, at therapy and do nothing for the other six days a week? Uh, stairs. Stairs have been my and my friend for this is almost day one. Um, I would always go outside. Sometimes I'd go out walking at midnight, use the street lights only, walking in the streets that I know, but knowing to get the feedback from my feet to my brain that how I'm walking, not looking at my feet, but looking ahead of me. And then I can't see them because it's dark anyway. So I just, you know, walking through grass, walking through gravel, you know, stuff. Anything that was, was not normal is the direction I went. So I was way outside my comfort zone. And as far as I can tell, that's where you, you get the biggest gains and where you need to be. John, in your bio, um, you talk about how your OT and your PT got you off to a good start. Would, not so much about how they did that, but that, that would be great. But 
how did that um, influence you and affect you and get you off to a good start? Well, they, they showed me that I can do something. I can get through this. Um, they would they would challenge me. And of course, every day I would had four or five sessions a day. As long as they made me sweat, at least one of those hours, they did their job. And that was their key point was they got me to sweat. Uh, they were doing things outside the box with me. They were uh, they had me laying face down off a mat, one of those mats, staring at the ground, trying to lift up a, um, a, a broomstick handle. And she was easy on my shoulder at the same time. And my, my doctor, my neurologist walked by one day. And I see was her feet. She goes, how's it going today? I said, I don't know. You, you, out, you tell me because I'm the one staring at the floor trying to figure this stuff out. And my therapist is sitting on, standing on my back trying to keep me level. I'm just staring at the floor trying to pull this bar up and I couldn't do it. But she's just stemming the crap out of my shoulder to get it to work. And they were just, I was forcing them to go outside their box also to figure things out with me because the normal stuff was not working. I was too, it was too easy for me. Uh, they put me on the BOSU ball between the parallel bars and said 20 squats, no touching. That was like week two of therapy. I'm going, okay. I said, can I touch with my pinky? Yes, but you can't hold on. You can touch, but no help holding on. So I would sit there and do squats. It was not pretty, but I would do squats right away. And then she would just challenge me even more. They'd give me homework to do. I didn't like that. I did not like being in a wheelchair every day. So when I'm any place, people always say, you want to sit down? No, I'm fine standing. I like being on these two legs. I, I earned my right to get back to these. I want to stay on them. Uh, standing up does not wear me out at all. Um, after I did the research study, I got into uh, saying, can I actually go back to, I used to be a jogger, so I would do 5Ks and half marathons around the state. Um, after I did that study in 2013, I decided to see if I could complete the mini marathon here locally in Indianapolis. It was 13.1 miles. I thought, well, I can try it. I got my stamina up on everything that I could handle it. Now I'm thinking for 13 miles was lift my knee, extend my foot, push off my toes. For, for three and a half hours, that's all I thought, thought about to my brain was doing this. I didn't want to stub my toe and go face down on the track somewhere. Uh, it took me three hours and I think 42 minutes to complete the first year. And everybody just freaked out that I was able to complete that. Um, I've done, done it four more times since then. I'm now like 320, 325 for my 13 miles. I've been training here locally to try to complete a full marathon in November if I can get that down pat. Wow. Did you find that by um, challenging your physical and occupational therapists that they responded and you got more out of them than if you had just been a typical or normal um, client? The fact that yes. you were meeting them more than halfway, did you feel like that enhanced your relationship with them? Yes, to push them even harder. Uh, my occupational therapist was just coming off maternity leave, and she was actually uh, more of a spinal cord therapist. But the only thing that was open was the stroke squad, or the stroke group, when she came back. So she took on my case day one, and uh, she challenged me big time, pushed me really hard. Uh, yeah, that's what I found, and I, I kind of preach um, establishing that kind of relationship with your therapist and doing the homework and coming back and impressing them. Because you end up with a, in my experience, a completely different relationship than if you show up and say, "I'm here, make me better." Um, right. They're not. They're not just hurting sheep through there. They're actually working with you to make you better. And they knew it. They knew I was ready to go home when I went home. They pushed me hard enough to get me out the door. And I've been friends with them ever since. And I talk to them whenever I go back in the facility. I stop and talk to them just to make sure they know that what they did back then and how it's affecting me now and how I'm doing much better now. So that their work they did paid off. That's really important because I've kind of done the same thing with my therapists and they, you know, they always tell you that they appreciate that because they work with, with a lot of people and they, and one of them actually said, you know, we see them walk out the door and that's it, you know, so they actually, um, they, they, they like that. And uh, so I think it's, a, you know, a good thing. I think that the work that you're doing with well, students is very important too, um, getting them some real world experience. I wish we could keep them with all those open minds and ideas when they enter the whole corporate and insurance world. But um, uh, at least you get to experience that. And I'm sure that's very um, gratifying for you as well to be doing it. And also you, I know a little something that other people don't know. You told me that like on the Zoom calls and stuff or when they're when you're just hanging around that they're all talking and you're listening, trying to pick up stuff. 
you know, they'll, they'll have a comment. That's why when they went to Zoom for this past year, it sort of ruined all that. But they would have to be talking to the side that the, the um, professor would come by and give them some instructions where and they're talking to the side. And it may just be a small little little tidbit they say that clicks with me that fits into a bigger part of the puzzle. But they don't realize that because they don't know what the big puzzle is yet. They're still students. And I can actually give them some feedback on that, too, or what they're talking about. I can tell them exactly what they're thinking is the exact area they need to go to. For, they, those, for those of you uh, who don't know, who may be watching this on YouTube, um, you know, it's kind of, a, we all feel it's kind of up to us as stroke survivors to take responsibility for our own recovery. And the, and the first, uh, one of the first um, components of that is learning everything that you can about your stroke, what kind of stroke you had, and getting this John referred to um, that big picture. If you if you can't look at yourself in terms of uh, you know the big picture, it's a lot harder to um, figure out what to focus on. So John, talk a little bit about how the superhero thing um, evolved, how it got started, and some of the fun that you've had with it. Hey, Ralph, if I may, before you go there, John, I want to respond to one thing you said sure. that fits in about three weeks ago, we did a presentation on being your own best health advocate. And you said, which I think is very important, you know, you got to, we have to share with our therapist what our expectations are. You know, what do you want to get out of this? Not what she wants to get. What do you want to get? Because you own this, you have to accept responsibility and accountability for our recovery. You know, I'm working with a, a lady now who, you know, she wants to get out of the wheelchair. And I said, well, did you tell the therapist that? And she said, no. I said, well, if you don't share that with her, how, do, how does she know what your goal is? And, and we as, as stroke survivors have a right to have our own expectations, but we need to share them. And that's part of being your own best health advocate. You know, they have a... Right, speak up. The squeaky wheel gets the oil. Squeaky wheel gets the oil. Yep, you're right. You're right on that, Dennis. I, I, had, I had a therapist that was just going through the motions with me because my other ther my occupational therapist was off for a week or so. And then when she came back, she had already made a phone call to IU Robotics to get me over to the robotics division to work on my my left shoulder, my left elbow, my wrist. But I, I didn't know she had made that phone call. So she'd already realized that I wasn't getting the gains in regular physical therapy. I needed something different. And she made the decision to push me over there, which was a bit, one of the good best decisions I thought with my left arm and working with my core. My shoulder was still locked up and my wrists were still locked up. And the robot helped that break that free, along with doing some actual extra physical therapy to get my core to break free. And I also went to a uh, massage therapist that was using a lot of essential oils on my shoulder and my arm. And she would, I could actually look down through the hole in the table and watch her on her tiptoes pressing into my shoulder and my arm to get this stuff to break free. She said, you need to drink a lot of water because I really pushed that shoulder hard. And she actually, with the between her massages and the oils and everything else, got my shoulder to break free and my arm to break free. We could feel within about four weeks doing it once a week I could, we felt the changes happen that quick. I'm also, um, I'm ex experimenting. You know, I've got a troublesome affected hip and I've been going to a neuro trained massage therapist. And I swear it about breaks me in half every week. <laughs> I've never been, I've never been Rolfed, but it's my idea of what Rolfing is about. Um, and uh, well, last week, apparently my ribs are rounded. And last week I uh, was laying there and he was pushing on me hard and a rib popped back in place. And, uh, but I found it um, uh, helpful. I, I would say my um, hip acts up only about half as much as it did. I think I've had four sessions now. And so I wouldn't discount um, massage therapy. However, you might want to make sure that the person that you're going to um, knows something about stroke or neuro or, um, or, you know, your, your condition rather than just, um, 
being a, a more normal massage therapist. Correct. So how did I, you... I would, I would, yeah, back to the, I did the advanced therapy for the 30 days and they had me walking around the building so many times every day just to time me and to push me a little harder. I, to one, like one time, I know there's a, a piece of apparatus I used to transfer people out of wheelchairs and stuff on wheels. Well, they would hook me up to that on you know, the harness and the therapist would sit on a rolling chair behind it, holding onto it and digging his heels in on the floor. So you hear it squeaking going through the hallways, but they're just putting a lot of resistance on me to pull. <coughs> and I'd been walking so many times around this, everybody's cubicles to the offices and stuff. I thought, I feel like flash. I just keep going, going faster. Every time I go by everybody's stuff, it's faster and faster. And the therapist that was doing one of the studies says, I have the flash costume from the Big Bang Theory. And I said, okay. I said, can I borrow it for the last session of my 30 day sessions, just for the fun of it? So he said, sure. So I was on the treadmill inside their little therapy office with the glass windows and all these people doing regular therapy outside the windows, trying to figure out who the guy in the red suit is and they're walking, walking on the treadmill. I mean, I have the harness on or else and I've got the mask on and I'm just walking, I'm going to burn it up because it's hot. But then they took me out through the, the hallways and stuff and a couple of therapists called me to the side and most of the therapists in that room knew me and this was a new therapy thing that they were trying. So they were all looking for feedback from me on how this stuff made me feel. And then with the costume on, it just said, here's how it made me feel right here. And at the same time, one of the therapists pulled me to the side and introduced me to Larry White, who's in the stroke squad. He was a friend, he's a friend, he on the, this was about an hour and a half away from me, but he and I had been friends ever since that day. And he's wanted to do everything I do. Now, I know he, he does more of a recumbent bike now than he does with walking, but he found his happy spot to do what he needed to do. And he and I have been friends ever since that day that therapist introduced us. But he said he needs some inspiration. I needed you to talk to him a little bit. And from that day, we've been friends ever since. And then he's been through the same therapy sessions I have. He also does the stuff at IUPUI every year, the wellness clinic. I've got him involved in that. And he loves it every bit. Um, but I started wearing the flash costume. And I, after I got done with that session, I went to clean it and I brought it back to the therapist. I said, how much do you want for this outfit? He goes, I will give you this outfit. He said, because I'm not going to wear it again. If you use it to inspire others. So that kicked off my superhero costumes. I used the flash to, for the bop to the top here in Indianapolis, which is a 36 foot, 36 floor stair climb, 780 steps. I do that. I do the triple climb. I climb it three times. Usually one trip, I'll put a 40 pound weight vest on for the first trip. And then the, the last two trips, I'll do it just with a, a shirt that, that goes to one of the colleges around here. Um, I've picked up um, Captain America I use for the mini marathon. And I use it also for the drumstick dash on Thanksgiving morning because those are two American holidays. I've picked up Iron Man to try to do with the stair climb also. I've always used Iron Man also for any of the winter events because I can wear the helmet and stay warm. Um, <laughs> I've uh, done Green Lantern for the shamrock for the for St. Patrick's Day because I didn't want to be Hulk. I wasn't Hulk. I'm not Hulk. I'm not Hulk. I'm just not that big. But the only thing I come up with is this uh, Green Lantern. So I used Green Lantern for that one. Um, I picked up uh, Deadpool I used, which I ordered a special Deadpool outfit the first year for Race for the Cure. And Susan be coming with me it's actually a, a pink Deadpool. And the following year, Ryan Reynolds come out with the FU Cancer pink Deadpool suit, pink and black. I'm going, why did you do that? You stole my idea. Um, but I already had that on it. I wear the pink one and the pink and black for that event and my my, we actually walked to the start line and my daughter's just apologizing to everybody the whole time. You know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then the minute they drop, they tell everybody to go, well, everybody's stopping and wanting selfies. And my daughter's going, all I did was tell everybody to go and the paparazzi comes out. I said, this is what happens when you wear stuff like this everywhere. I mean, I've got the, I've got the swords on my back. I've got the play guns on my side and make sure the local cops don't try to shoot me and take me down. But they're just plastic green, green, blue guns. So I get, um, but I do this too give back to the therapist that everybody knows it's a therapist that gave me my life back. And this also brings another thing about men's health and anybody's health without stroke. So I use this to, to promote stroke awareness and men's health and to give back to the therapist. So that's where the superhero costumes of story come in because that's the way the therapist made me feel after this, everything they've worked on is made me feel like I'm invincible again. I know I'm not, but I take control of my life and what's going on with it. And the biggest advocate for myself is myself or biggest advocate for my recovery is myself. So that's where I push everything. And I will give anything, any advice to anybody else 
that needs advice out there, I'll do special videos for you. I'll help in any way, shape, or form you can. I'll share every bit of knowledge that I take in. If, if it's something you're working on or something you may talk to me about, I may have a session with students in my cat, and I'll ask the students. And sometimes they give me some feedback that I can give back to somebody else. It's all free. The knowledge is all free. But that's it's been my journey to take this on, I guess, as in my new journey to try to promote against stroke awareness and try to make people believe that they can do better. Because I, I, all I ever knew about stroke was you didn't last for a couple of years after the stroke. Well, here I am seven and a half years after stroke and I'm just fine. I'm actually healthier now than I was prior to the stroke. Um, you touched on something um, about, you know, dragging the wheelchair around. Uh, I, I one time I had this crazy thought I think probably all of us got attached to that giant rubber band around your waist where you like the therapist holds on and like you walk until you can't walk because the rubber band's pulling you backwards. I, I'm a video guy, as some of you know, and one time I shot for uh, a fitness club and they had a CrossFit um, division and I went out, I shot in the regular club and then I went out to the CrossFit decision, uh, division and shot. And I don't know, one time I was thinking about the rubber band and everything, I was thinking, wouldn't it be cool to like do a CrossFit for stroke survivors? And I'm not talking about like the 800 pound tires or stuff that, I mean, they were doing 800 pound six foot tires and stuff out there. Some kind of, um, you know, similar thing um, that would challenge, um, challenges the stroke survivors and also, um, uh, be good for um, recovery. So I wondered what you and Michelle might think about that idea. Of course, it's another one of my ideas that like, where can you build it? You need a, a thousand of them around the country, like, you know, like CrossFit uh, training places are now already. Or, or I also thought, wonder if you could get like a CrossFit place to let you bring stroke survivors out there at two o'clock in the afternoon or sometime when nothing's going on. So that's my nutty idea for the day. That's not a bad idea. No, it's not. I mean, I know RHI has now got their, um, you can sign up to do treadmill work with them. I think it's $25 a session, but they also have the bag that can put weight in behind you. You drag a bag across the floor. It's designed to be dragged. So you, you've got an actual like 50, 60 pounds you're trying to drag, which I thought about doing here also trying to make some sort of sled thing to work out and just run it off a carpet to take some of the resistance away made a little bit easier but right it gets you pushing off your toes and trying to re-extend your leg out get that heel so you get that roll through your foot to your toes again i've realized that from pushing carts at work the one thing i didn't bring in here was i work for menards first thing in the morning i do morning stock every morning um there are some things i couldn't do when i first took on this job that i can do now there's still some things that i've taken on more that i can't do yet uh, i use my arm as much as i can i use my legs as much as i can i mean i usually work till 5 a.m. to 10 a.m. and I'm usually leave there close to 20,000 steps by the time I leave work in the morning. And sometimes I've moved 50, 60 pound bags around. I've pushed carts away several hundred pounds. And I also, when I'm doing that, I'm trying to do workouts at the same time. So I'm focusing on my arm and focusing on my knee and working on my foot, my ankle, everything just at the same time while I'm working. So it's a paid therapy for me. And it's four days a week. Those of you who are watching on YouTube, you also a common thread amongst most of us here is that therapy is all around you and like john was saying his therapist said go work in the yard mow the push push the push mower i did that i just did it on my own nobody told me to i just found that holding on to things like the steering wheel when i started driving again it was real good and i started driving left-handed uh, affected arm only because i was worried about it going Oop, you know <laughs> into a cement truck or something um, but, but I overcame that. So uh, most of us here believe that therapy is all around you and that, you know, you can, part of a home program can simply be doing the things that you normally do or the things that you need to do, like washing dishes or cooking or whatever, and using that affected hand as much as you can. People will say, oh, well, it doesn't do much. Well, it doesn't do much maybe because you're not trying to do much with it. And yeah, I mean, you, you yeah. might want to switch to the plastic plates for the first couple of months and not the fine china, but, you know, try <laughs> washing dishes and, and, and try doing things with it. Um, when I tell this to people that, that I coach, 
I often hear back, you know, well, I got somebody right now in Tulsa, Oklahoma. She started doing this stuff and she said, oh, we did spring cleaning today. And then, you know, another thing, oh, I, um, I cooked a meal all by myself. My son didn't have to help me and, and those kinds of things. I, I started hearing that back and it's, you know, so I got a, it was true for me. And then when I hear it's true for other people, you know, we start to believe that it's good advice. Those of us who are pay it forward people, as I used to call them until yesterday, those of us who are stroke <laughs> veterans, um, try and pass on good information. So we pay attention to what people are saying. Um, so that when we hear a whole collective thing, Yesterday in Michelle's group, we were talking about people were saying, you know, my arm hurts or it twinges or whatever. And we've seen that so much that's typically a sign of um, your brain connecting back with, with your arm. John's yeah. shaking his head now because I was talking about this yesterday. And he said, yeah, I've noticed that. I completely agree. So we see enough posts where uh, that we get some confidence in the fact that, you know, we can say typically and we most of us will do this and say, you know, typically or usually that's a, that's a good sign. It means that your, that your arm's connected to your brain. Cause if you haven't been feeling tingling or pain or whatever, it's not real connected. And we'll typically advise people to, um, while that's happening to, um, uh, try working it, you know, maybe your brain's trying to tell you something. Body awareness is one of the keys to good recovery. I mean, number one's got to be attitude because if you don't wake up, you know, with a glass is half full, I'm going to kick ass today attitude um, most every day and you cannot do it every day. Um, you, you can't. Um, no, you're but right. That's the most important thing. And another thing is, you know, um, and part of that's kind of taking responsibility for your recovery, but paying attention to your body and good body awareness are, are, are really key because you want to know what you want feedback from yourself. Agreed. And you have to know that you can try everything yourself and there may be times you can't quite get it and it's okay to ask for help to get the, the task accomplished. There's no shame in that whatsoever to ask for a little bit of help. But it doesn't mean next time that task comes up, you can't try it yourself again to see if you, you gain, have any gains since then. Um, well, and I was like you, John. I was a complete maniac in the beginning. And my attitude was if I couldn't do it, I wasn't going to do it halfway because that was cheating. And I actually used that word cheating. And I've come to learn that that's wrong. Um, it was a, t too much of a gung-ho attitude. And um, being a guy, you know, guys are worse about this than women are. Um, being gung ho and light switch on, light switch off, no gray. Um, and plenty of gray. There's plenty of gray. So <laughs> I've learned since then that what you do is you try and break it down. You try and simplify it. Um, they were asking me to do something at physical therapy recently where I started on the ground. I put my affected leg up on the first step and then they wanted me to take my unaffected leg and go through the entire motion up to the second step, but not put it down and then put it, bring it all, hover for a few seconds. Now you're hovering with that leg out in front of you on your affected leg and then bring it all the way back down. Well, I tried it and I couldn't do it and I get frustrated real easy. I, I'll admit that. And, um, so I said to the therapist, uh, I don't know, I went way out on a limb. I said, hang on, let me try something here. And so what I did was I noticed that when I went up with my non-affected foot to the second step, that I could do it pretty well if I just touched the step, just light touch the step with my toe. So I did 10 of those to kind of pattern myself. And then I looked at him again and said, okay, here goes. And I went to do it. I, I couldn't do it at all before. And after I did 10 of them to pattern myself, I managed to do eight out of 10 uh, with the hovering. And so you can sometimes learn part of a task on your way to learning the whole thing, breaking yeah. it down yes. or break adapt, it down. You're right. Or making it easy. The one finger, John, can, I can't believe they had you doing Bosu ball squats. Uh, at two weeks, you know, when I got my BOSU ball and started doing squats, I think it was about 10 and a half years out. 
Me too. I've got my own here in the in the basement. I, I got my own, own there too. I saw a woman. I saw a woman just. You know, as a stroke survivor, you just. It's just uh, amazing to watch other people, and they don't realize the gift that they have of being able to move without thinking about it, not having had a stroke. You know. So I'm at the gym, and I'm you know I'm doing some kind of bridges or clamshells or some kind of crap over and over again i watch this woman she just walks up and steps right on the bosu ball and i went wow so i went over and tried it mm -mm, no way at <laughs> first. <laughs> but now i can do squats without holding on and pull a theraband while i'm doing it while looking out at infinity yeah, focus, focus on one point keep your balance focus yeah. on one point yeah so see look what you hear in here folks okay so john and i have had similar journeys. I said in my introduction that he's an adapter. He said, you know, when I got home, I just decided to use a whatever, you know, I had somebody I took to physical therapy and they had him on parallel bars with a $150 maple therapy block. Well, I got a piece of scrap four by four and I put some sandbags on a regular walker and I had parallel bars you couldn't tip over. Since, right. then, since then I built a set. So one of the keys to all this stuff is, you know, don't run into dead ends when, you know, so many people say, oh, well, I tried it and I couldn't do it. Well, did you try and do it halfway? Did you try and do the best that you could, even though it looked awful? Um, typically not. So what's happening happened here is John and I basically have had similar experiences. We adapted and invented some of the same things we've discovered uh, through talking together. And so one of the points of this is to pass on that kind of information. Because, you know, a lot of us here, we think it's crazy that 800,000 people a year have a stroke and there's no manual. Dennis left, but Dennis goes, they didn't give me a manual. Well, no, there is no manual. No manual. And so we're all sent out to reinvent the wheel for ourselves, which is stupid, stupid. I mean, it's just crazy. So the first thing that we're trying to do is, is get that kind of information to stroke survivors. Another goal of mine and uh, John and Michelle and some other folks Michelle, yes. kind of trying, I'm trying to kind of form a, a pack of, um, veterans or pay it forward people <laughs> so we can advance this idea because what we think is why aren't the therapists listening to us we've been you know john will tell you he's in, he's figured out things that no one ever told him in physical therapy uh, in another group that, that i run we did a program the other night on neuroplasticity and how to maximize it no physical therapist has ever said the word neuroplasticity to me Never, ever have they said it to you, John or no, Michelle? Not at all. No, no, no. So, I mean, it's a concept that they didn't believe in 30 years ago. They thought the brain was set once you're an adult, no more neurons. And now they know that's not true. And now they know that neuroplasticity exists throughout your life, no matter how old you are and no matter how far out you are on your stroke. I sometimes I've made a couple of videos on things that I've learned to do way, way out to kind of demonstrate this concept. One was learning to throw a tennis ball with my affected arm. Being a video guy, I like to do things that are real visual. So I set that all up with a course and stakes and I staked out my progress and all that stuff. Because I think if you can show somebody something, visually, they, they really, they really get it. Um, yes, I agree. The visual part. Uh, but I'm a visual learner, you know. I always said, you know, <coughs> with my physical therapist and occupational therapist, I would tell them, show me once, let me do it for you, and then I got it. Yep. Um, so A lot of times they put the mirror in front of me so I could see my reactions because what I think I'm doing is not exactly what I am doing, but for me to see what I'm doing makes right. a big difference. Yeah, I used the mirror a lot. I did like symmetry stuff. I, you know, put my arms over in different ways and, you know, try to make sure I'm level. And, you know, so you think, you know, you do this with that. Well, first you do it by looking down that affected arm. But, you know, then you want to get it to like walking in the dark to where you're not looking at your feet. You know, you want to, um, 
be able to put that arm out flat without looking at it in the dark or whatever. It's a form of proprioception. Uh, just like when you're standing at the walker doing that step up or the step over with that $150 maple therapy block or the scrap piece of 4x4, four four, after you get good at it and you know where your foot is, I, te I try and teach people, okay, now close your eyes and do it. Because you really want to be able to know where that foot's going when you're walking. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm sure, John, that's what, what you're doing when you go out and walk at night and go four-wheeling. That's what the, my therapist, one day we, <laughs> when I was still in the rehab hospital, the therapist said, we're going to go outside and go four-wheeling. And they had a little patio set up. It was kind of cool. They had like stepping stones and gravel, grass. Right concrete walkway so we walked in the thick grass and they made sure they didn't cut it um, right because that's a completely different challenge if you're not picking up that affected foot you definitely know it in in the grass yes. i used the grass because i didn't have anybody to walk me and i was still needed a gate belt and all of a sudden i had a friend come for a week and walk me on the gate belt the first week i got out of the hospital the second week i said i'm not going back to sitting in that damn wheelchair all day i'm going to walk <laughs> somehow so i walked out right. on the grass because i figured if i fell in the grass it would be a lot better than falling on my concrete driveway where i'd been walking and after a week or so of that i had the confidence to go back up to the concrete driveway which is a lot better for drop foot which i definitely had at that time so yeah i've been any of the courses i've ever done both at rhi and at the colleges have always been multi-services i mean rhi has a ramp system set up inside their building for you to work with a wheelchair either wheelchair at the top of a ramp they also have their steps set up but the steps are set up for like the curb of next to the street a sidewalk curb and there's like four or five different steps but they're set up for the world outside the building for you to work on Right, and I had my stroke in the North Carolina mountains, so everything was up and down. So I got pretty good at um, at up and down. They weren't easy. Down's a lot harder. Up's real easy because you know when you're going up that if nothing else, if that you're going to fall forward and you can always go to all fours and crawl. When you're walking downhill, you know that that's a long way to fall and you're going to tumble. Yeah, and no end. And the fear, yeah. Hey Michelle, you want to have a uh, uh, want another topic that we could talk about for a long time, and that would be the impact of fear and how to overcome it in stroke recovery, because I think it plays a huge factor. I know, a lot of people, a lot of people won't go walking because they're afraid they fall, they can't get up. Right. They don't have the confidence, but to build yeah. confidence, you have to do it. <laughs> right. It's catch twenty two. You, right. you, have to, you have to do it to get over it, and you can't do it because of the fear. Yeah. So, to get out, outside your comfort zone. That's where you have your biggest gains. You have to get out the there, zone. or nothing's right. going to change. It's if the you, only place you grow. Yeah, if you do the same thing every day, it's not going to change anything. If you have to get outside your comfort zone to make the biggest changes. Okay, well, since you said that, uh, that reminded me, one of the things in that presentation on neuroplasticity is the reason most people plateau is that the brain gets used to whatever it's doing. The brain needs to be challenged, challenged. in order to work. Um, in that presentation, we talked about performing everything in an enriched environment. Um, so the brain, you know, challenging the brain. So typically what happens is you go to physical therapy and in the beginning, they're giving you all kinds of new stuff and you know, the curve goes up like this for the first five or six or seven weeks and then it starts flattening out and flattening out. And then right about here, they start going, oh, you're not making any progress. The insurance company might not wanna pay for you anymore. And the problem is that they're having you do the same thing. They're not challenging your brain. When you reach a plateau, it's time to mix up your routine. If yes. you uh, do something different, um, this this is uh, one of the ways we discovered that was through these groups. What happens is people get released from insurance and they want to get better. So they go and do stuff at home. Typically, what do they do? Um, these are motivated people who don't necessarily know what to do. So they, they ask their physical therapist for homework, like right before they leave. Okay, what can I do now? I can't come and see you anymore. Well, you can't go and do that for six months. You can do that for six weeks, 
but then you need new stuff all new stuff. the time. New stuff, new stuff, because you got to challenge that brain. Um, That's where if I'm out doing a lot of my walking, I monitor my times, my distances and stuff like that. If I see it starting and nothing's changing, I'll put the, I have my own 40 pound weight vest. I'll put it on and start walking and yeah, start putting it going four to six miles at a time. Or I'll go do 25 sets on the stairs and try not to touch the handrail just to push myself, push my legs a little more and get different, different muscle groups activated because the muscle groups I was using are at their maximum right now. I need to get the rest of the groups involved. Right. Since the body is so complex. You can go back to all that stuff that you drop. It's really a matter of mixing it up to keep that, that the brain challenged and stimulated. Um, yes. So, uh, I mean, I, I, you talked about making stuff at home. Everybody, let the, you know, they have you walk a balance beam. Okay, you start with just spend a piece of piece of tape on the floor and just start walking that heel to toe, and do it next to a wall if you need to, and do forwards and backwards, and you can still touch the wall. For your balance or have a chair next to you for your balance um you can go to any most um clothing or cloth stores and you can pick up foam pads well they always have you stand on a foam pad mark a line down the middle of that pad and put that in your um where you just put the tape on the floor put that on your line so then you have to step from the floor to the pad then back off the pad to the floor and if you get comfortable with that then just walk on a take a two by four and set it on the floor walk on the two by four most balance beams are three and a half inches wide, three inches wide, the two by four is three and a half. So you, okay, a little half inch more than that. So you just practice working on the, in you, on the two by four. And again, you can do that sit, just sitting in the hallway or whatever, where you got a wall next to you just for balance, but you can still work to, hey, I'm gonna do this today without touching. And if you, if you fall off, well, you fall off what, an inch to the ground. So you're not really high up in the air, like on a balance beam where you're gonna hit the ground somewhere. You can step off and catch yourself. But the idea is you want to get past that whole eight foot long balance or eight foot long two by four without touching anything or falling off and learn how to place your feet and get your ankles right and adjust how your how they're going to set. So it's I just, actually have it, a video of that on my YouTube channel. It's called Stroke Summer Camp. We did this kind of like <laughs> summer camp goofy thing. Well, I mean, it's an idea. There are stroke summer camps. You know, it's like kind of like my CrossFit idea. You know, I'd love to run a summer camp and have people come and 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 do stuff. Well, we did one. I have a friend who's an occupational therapist who's pretty much a physical therapist too. His wife is a director of physical therapy at a hospital, so they're all you know he's around a lot of it. And um, he had a friend down from Canada that we were challenging. I was videoing it and helping with the challenging, and we set up a bunch of two by fours. And we get Brent to walk him. Well, he can't walk him at all in the beginning because he's why? Fear. He's afraid. He's afraid yep. he's going to fall. So John walks with him and he walks. So he walks one by himself with John, like near him, my, my friend, the OT. And then he asks John if he can put one finger on his shoulder. And he does three laps with his finger on his shoulder. And then he's able to do it without the finger on the shoulder because he's spent enough time in that zone. I'm a big believer in this fear thing that you have to spend enough time in the doing the task properly and safely in that zone to convince your brain that, um, that, that, that it's all right to do it and not to have that fear. And I'm 13 years out and I still find in certain situations, my brain conjures up some fear it's something that I've been able to do for 10 years. It's, it's insane how long it, it takes to get rid of the fear. So I have a, I had a guy I was walking on a gate belt and I was going there twice a week. He can only walk for about 20 minutes or half an hour before he got fatigued. So, I mean, I can't go there and do three hours with him. So doing like half an hour twice a week Well, I was seeing a couple other people and I couldn't get over there more. So I came up with this idea when I started thinking about this whole zone and fear thing. I took a regular roller tour walker and I put my two sandbags on it. It's got 50 pounds of weight on it. You can't turn that sucker over. And I was surprised on smooth surfaces like the road. Um, it pushes as, almost as if there's no sandbags on it. And of course I, tried uh, steering it only with my uh, strong arm because I know that somebody's going to say, 
I can't do that because I only have one arm. I'm sorry, I shouldn't do that. Um, but we get that a lot. You know, I can't do that because I only have what my arm doesn't work. Well, have you ever tried like walking with a rollator, steering it with your good arm? Because it's really not that hard. People seem to get defeated a lot. So I ended up, I set this whole thing up and I took it over there, and I, uh, you know, because what I wanted him to do was um, walk up and down the street so he could spend half an hour every day, you know, in that lack of fear zone, walking on his own. We were trying to get him off of the four point cane to nothing, uh, right. walking him just with a gait belt. So, you know, just light touching the rollator. They're a lot like shopping carts, which are make excellent walkers. Uh, yeah, they do. I actually take people to to uh, the store to walk with shopping carts while I shop. Stroke survivors. Do you make them pay though? No. <laughs> no. The rides free. The gas is free. The nagging's free. All the you know. Okay, you know, walk between this. I've you know taken people into Home Depot and said. Well, look, let's go in the back because there's less people than in front of the cash register. And I'll send them like walking the entire length of the building until I come back for them. Um, it's just, it's real good for patterning. Yeah. I've been, I've, I got on a shopping cart one time. I tried to hit bash my shins on it and you can't do it. As long as you've got your arms, as long as you don't change your arms, you can't hit your shins on one. Um, yes, I'll do it. I'll have a whole cart full of um, plank boards and they'll put it up on top of a blue cart and it's uh, probably six, 700 pounds. Well, I have to, once we take certain things out, I have to push it down to another aisle. Well, a lot of times I'd be just pushing with one side and my shoulder and that. Now I get to the point where I put my arm, my hand up there and push off forward and push this thing forward and make sure my arm's engaged and shoving that whole thing forward. And if, if I get off a little bit, it's going to turn to go left to right. So I have to make sure I keep my, Side my everything going in the right direction. You know, I've had to push harder with my left arm to get it out there, and I push it out there. But originally, I couldn't move that cart once I put that stuff up there. But now I can move that cart and push it off my legs. I mean, sometimes even if I just use it off my shoulder, my legs are I'm doing the cross stepping as I'm doing it. I'm not just pulling my foot up to the other one and extend my right foot back out again. My left foot's crossing my right and then pushing my my right's pushing down, then left foot's pushing down off the side of my foot. Well, and you're making my point here, which was, you know, get out the plastic dishes and try washing them. You know, when you can't do something, you know, I tell the people I, I work in case uh, um, you don't know, like Mandy, or I, I work with uh, 13 local stroke survivors uh, where I actually go do physical therapy with them. And what I tell my guys and gals is, uh, you know, if you can't do something right, you got a lot of them in your future. <laughs> <laughs> that's true it's the only way you didn't learn okay. how to push that cart by being on facebook groups you learned it by every every morning you know giving it another shot and that's where uh, menards the people actually the people at the store corporate may not like it but they know sometimes i take my phone and i'll shoot a quick video just to show people things that you can do and where i'm at from where i was a year ago and I just take a quick two, three minute video and put my phone back away and they're okay with that because I don't really share it corporate wise. I share it in the groups here. Right. And Corporate might not like that, but you know, I think it's wonderful that they're, um, I, I'm not saying they're bending the rules or anything, but they're, you know, they're giving you a, an opportunity. I, th I think they're allowing I, it. I think yeah. all of them for that. Yeah. They, it's a couple of the bosses. I say, you know, if you see my phone sitting on an edge or something like that video on me, I'm just trying to show people that things you can accomplish things and what I what I go through on a daily basis, but I consider my therapy, and it is out of the outside the box therapy for what I consider, you know, that's not doing stuff on a table, you're not sitting at a table, you're not standing somewhere. I mean, I'll throw a right. pack of two by twos, I think there's 24 to a pack, put them on my shoulder and walk up the stairs and go put them away. Yeah. I mean, I'll just walk with them and just I lean down enough to I can get the balance on my shoulder and this hands holding in place, and then I'll walk up the stairs holding these on my shoulder. Knowing if I'd misstep, and the, the stairs are the metal great ones where your foot grabs, so they're not smooth. Oh, yeah. So if, if I do go down, my knees are gonna get really shredded. <laughs> so I have tells me not to fall forward, even though like it's a possibility. But you can't scrape your feet. Your feet have to be lifted up because they won't slide. Well, that's right. really interesting. When we do that program on um, fear, 
we can bring in the opposite side of fear because I've done that same thing. I've um, put myself in situations basically where you're going to get really hosed if something goes wrong and you have to do it right. So in a sense, you're using fear in a, in a positive way. Yeah, I discovered one, you're talking about that bundle of six. So I was building a raised garden beds with um, two by eights, 16 feet long. And I'm thinking, how am I going to maneuver these things? I was going to build them on my back deck right out there. And it's up three steps. And I was like, oh, man, how am I going to carry these things up three steps? So I just decided to try it. And I put, I grabbed one of them and... I walked right up the steps like nothing because it was like, you know, if you think about the flying Walindas, yeah, they, they Walindas, yeah. You, you get the balance just right and it's not, it's, it won't throw you off. Right. You get the balance right. And it's actually that board was helping me be stable. Giving you this, you're put, pushing your feet down, pushing your body weight down to be stable. Yes. Right. I, I enjoyed it so much. I went up and down about a half a dozen times to that one board, <laughs> you know, going, well, I, you know, I like, I see. I noodle around like John. I mean, how do we discover this stuff? We try stuff. We noodle around all the time. So I went up and down like you know six times. I said, I'm on to something here. Maybe you could you know use a board to you know train yourself with um, balance. And yeah, you know, my wife got a little and uh, uh, wanted to work on the boxes we were um, building. So uh, after a half a dozen tries, I uh, went back to the, what we were doing. And, yeah, but, had to go back to your project. Yeah, but again, you know, I use yard work um, a lot. I painted my house this spring. I I build stuff. Uh, you know, anything that I can do to use both hands and challenge my brain. Um, yeah, summer before last, I built two decks, one on both sides of the house, a ten by twenty and a, a eight by ten on the front. Right. The only help I needed was augering the holes down. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to start that auger up and also wife pulling the driveway. I'm going me, 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 me on top of it because it won't stop <laughs> or wait for it to run out of gas. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I got my brother-in-law. There were like four places in my house where I just wasn't comfortable going that high on the ladder. because I'm not supposed to be on ladders at all, you know, and five steps up on an eight foot ladder. That was my max. If I couldn't reach it, I'd let my brother-in-law do it. So, you got to sometimes use the cognitive abilities that you got left with to say uh, it would be stupid to do, you know, to 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 go higher and and cut yourself some slack and say it's OK. On the other hand, you know, I'm 71 years old and a stroke survivor and I painted my whole damn house. You know, I'm yeah. slow at it. I, I, I typically work for like an hour and I sit down for five minutes until I feel like stupid. Like, why am I sitting here? It's time to get back to work. But, right. Um, you know, so I, I, and sometimes it's more than five minutes, but, you know, um, am I fastest? Hell no. Do I keep at it? Hell yes. Yeah, it, it takes a little longer, but the same way. I have my AC unit went out of my car two weeks ago. So I bought the part and I was changing it out. My son finally showed up and goes, what are you doing? I said, well, I got this off already. He goes, you got the part off already? I said, yeah, the belt's off, super team belt's off. The three bolts are undone. I'm ready to slide it off the, the uh, studs and go put the other one in. He goes, you were supposed to wait till I got here. He said, we want to you do a YouTube channel with the one arm mechanic. I said, will you quit it? <laughs> <laughs> so how many times did you cuss at your left hand getting that part off? I didn't. I got it in there. I was using it, especially to get the silver team belt off because you have to do the, ten the, the tensioner out of the way plus take the belt out of the way. So. My left hand, I got the tension where I needed to be in the left hand. Oh, yeah. I mean, back. you have to hold something while you do yeah. something else. Now make sure I'm not going to not gonna injure it. It's got a glove on it. Make sure I don't scratch it up or tear it up. I don't need to put any cuts or anything on it. Yeah, I used to do, do that with my affected hand because I have, like, delayed uh, sensitivity for, like, hot. I could put my hand on a burner that's hot. I, I don't, and I won't. But you, know, you test it every now and then? My hand on a burner that was hot it takes about two seconds before I get the signals. And once I get the signals, it's too late. Um, so I'm real careful about that stuff. So yeah, sometimes I'll like wear a glove on my affected hand just because I'm worried about sensory input or lack of sensory input. I, I wear, put a glove on every morning. Everybody says, why do you wear a glove? Are you trying to be Michael Jackson? I said, no. <laughs> this, I pick up sheet metal, I pick up wood, I do various 
types of stuff all day long. It's, I can't just stop to put on this glove, take five minutes, put a glove on. I just put it on first thing in the morning. My hand's nice and relaxed, and it's there all day for what I need it to have. I mean, a lot, I get a lot of splinters in my right hand. It sucks because it's hard to get them out of there. Um, yeah. A lot of, two, a lot of two by fours, a lot of four by fours. I end up getting a lot of splinters. Sheet metal. I've got my pants cut before, or stuff might slide. It might have like four or five pieces of sheet metal at the same time, and the middle one will slide because it's covered in oil, and my pants take the beating. So I take it just to protect this hand so I don't injure it any more than what than it already is, being not being used. Um, well, the boss has walked up to me one day. He goes, he says, you know, I I have to admire what you do because you work circles around most of the people here because I that's just why I am. He said, but but literally you go to the left all the time. So you, you walk circles around everybody. So when you quit it, <laughs> well, I get this half a person stuff every day at work. It's just constant. And there's people don't, it's, it's, people, all, it's all done and fun. And we have a blast with it. People don't pick on you unless they like you. Oh, but they know that I do most, I do more work than a lot of people there in the five hours I'm there. I, I'm always busy. If there's no work to do, I go home. I mean, there's no sense me sitting on the clock for nothing. If I've done all my cleaning work or shelf work or anything else, I just let the boss know, hey, I've done everything I'm supposed to do. Is there anything else you need done around the building? He'll probably say no. I say, okay, I'm going home. Yeah, and yeah, I, I, I make up for my slowness by just sticking to it. Yeah. You keep at it. It's like recovery. You know, I learned a exactly. lot of recovery. You learn that, you know, sometimes you don't see immediate results, uh, but it's okay because eventually you will. And, you know, I learned that um, if you stick, well, I, I knew this before from growing up uh, with my paper route and mowing lawns and everything. But if you um, if you stick to something, um, you'll get there eventually. So people that give up. So maybe this is a good time to end it.